In junior high school, I didn't have any close friends. In my neighborhood, most of the baby boomer teenagers had graduated and moved away. There weren't any kids living within walking distance who were even in the same grade level that I was. The closest age was a kid three doors down, Charlie Pop, and he was two grade levels behind. He would be entering junior high as I was transitioning to high school. So even back then, I knew that that friendship wouldn't survive. I didn't play any sports, so I didn't have any teammates that I could make friends of. So in the summer between junior high school and high school, I signed up for a week-long summer camp where my hope was that I could make some friends. On a cool early August morning, my mother dropped me off at Aurora Village, which was a strip mall in North Seattle. It's where all the kids were getting picked up for camp. I met up with my cousin Jimmy there, who was also a first time summer camper. Because he was related to me, Jimmy technically couldn't be counted as a friend. We had to be together just by default. Jimmy did have two Van Halen 1979 World Tour baseball hats and was generous enough to give me one to wear. This was great not only because I thought Van Halen was kick ass awesome, but two years into being a teenager, my hair was always super oily and greasy. And if I had a hat to put over the grease mop, all the better. So I'd never been to a summer camp before. So my expectations of what to expect were based on a Bill Murray movie called Meatballs. It's a teen comedy about misfits spending a week together at Camp North Star. Problems come up but they are solved with a great deal of hilarity by the camp counselor who was played by no other than Bill Murray. The kids on the bus fit the roles of that which I've seen in the movie. So there was a loud mouth and the complainer and of course the fat kid. And I was probably the kid that wanted to have friends. When the bus arrived at Miracle Ranch, we got a glance at Horseshoe, Horseshoe Lake uh, where we'd be swimming, as well as the cozy cabins where we would be sleeping every night. Now, the cabin slept six campers and had one counselor. Our counselor, a guy named Randall, showed us the bunk beds and allowed us to self-select, which we did quickly. Jimmy and I took bottom bunks, and above me, the spot was claimed by a camper with the unfortunate name of Dean Weiner. Not a good name to have if you're a teenager. Randall was probably 30 years old, but to us teenage campers, he seemed ancient. He was twice our age, and on top of that, he was an old 30. He had a permanent limp, and he walked with a cane. He explained that it was from his car accident. He was dour and serious all the time, and very much not like Bill Murray. He was also cross-eyed, which made it difficult to focus in on where to look when talking to him. Having Randall as a camp counselor felt more like having a building caretaker looking over us than a wisecracking, happy-go-lucky mentor. About the only fun thing he had was a spray bottle. He said that he hoped he didn't have to use it on us in the morning, but if we got up too slowly, he would come on out and spray us. Kind of cool, I guess. The camp day was broken up into half hour long activity blocks. Campers could canoe or swim in the lake, shoot arrows at bales of hay, and even ride horses and motorcycles. Swimming was popular because it was the peak of the Pacific Northwest summer, and the lake would never get any warmer than it was. At the start of every swim session, there was a safety briefing by one of the camp counselors. It was strictly against the rules to swim alone. We always had to be with a partner. So the system they had was that the counselor had three plastic chips with identical numbers on them. They each had a lanyard attached to them. Each swimmer took a chip and a lanyard. And then the third one was hung up on the buddy board. Before anyone got in the water, the counselor led a group prayer where she thanked Jesus for the beautiful day and we prayed for our safety. It was a summer camp for Christians, so 
this didn't seem too far out of the ordinary. At the end of the swim session, all the swimmers left the lake and returned to the buddy board to return their tags. The tags were matched up, but the counselor realized that two swimmers had not returned. She brought out the emergency bullhorn and summoned all available counselors to come to the swim area. Us kids watched the urgency of the commotion and we had this feeling that some really bad shit was gonna be going down, like maybe somebody even drowned. About a dozen adults held each other's hands and formed a human chain. They waded into the lake and walked perpendicular to the shoreline. So in theory, if the two dead swimmers that had sunk to the bottom of the swimming area uh, were down there, their lifeless bodies would brush up against the counselor's legs as they walked past. Now, of course, the swimmers hadn't drowned. They were just excited about the day and they had forgotten to go back to the buddy board to return their tags. They made themselves known to the adults. Uh, they were then publicly ashamed and the search and rescue effort was called off. The head counselor thanked Jesus for delivering them from drowning and dismissed us to our next camp activity. On the part of the counselors, they demonstrated classic passive aggressive Seattle behavior. My next activity was motorcycle riding. I went to the motorcycle dirt bike riding area, was given vague instructions on how to ride a motorcycle, and then we all prayed for our safety. Well, the prayer didn't work. I, worked, I, I wiped out in the first 10 minutes. Uh, the motorcycle had a manual transmission so that when I downshifted, I was thrown off balance and the motorcycle went out from underneath me. I landed on my left forearm and I rubbed off a few layers of skin and I drew some blood as well. But for a 14 year old in the time of Evil Knievel, this wasn't considered an accident. It was a bloody badge of honor. Now I had an injury and a Van Halen 1979 World Tour baseball hat, which separated me from all of the other boys. When the afternoon activities were over, it was dinner time. The campers went to the cafeteria where we loaded up on our plates and waited for the group prayer before digging in. Randall, perhaps hoping to build cabin camaraderie, suggested that we challenge some of the other tables with a milk drinking competition. Some of the neighboring tables accepted our challenge and all of our glasses were filled with white dairy gold whole milk. We drank quickly. When our first two gallon bottle of whole milk was empty, Randall would hold it up in the air and we'd cheer. He'd limp to the kitchen and return with another bottle for us to empty. I was getting the sense that we were catching the attention of some of the girl campers, which is always good. Not only did I have a Van Halen 1979 World Tour baseball hat and a motorcycle scar, I also could prove that I could drink a lot of milk. We kept up the pace, bloating, cramps, gas, and diarrhea be damned. For some reason, the girls were smart enough not to take part in the competition. After dinner, we returned to the cabin for digestion and teenage discussion about superheroes and their powers. Keep in mind, we were new to being teenagers and hadn't completely left childhood behind. We tried to get Randall to admit that if Jesus had the supernatural powers to perform any miracle, he should have done a miracle on himself. It was obvious. He could have made himself able to fly or have laser vision or a body that the Romans couldn't crucify. Randall said that this just wasn't the way that Jesus operated, which didn't make any sense to us because if Jesus wanted everyone to become Christians, it would seem like flying over the Holy Land would be the best way to convert people. Our conversation was making him feel uncomfortable. Randy cut our chit chat short and told us it was time to leave for evening chapel. The cafeteria had been transformed into a chapel. The tables were moved to the side and the plastic chairs were arranged in five rows that faced the front. Our cabin was the first to arrive, so we had the front row seats. 
a thin man wearing a Miracle Ranch t-shirt did a sound check on the microphone. His amplified voice told Lucifer that he wasn't welcome and that he should be banished back to hell to where he belongs. Most people would just say, check, one, two, three. But like I said, it was a Christian summer camp. 